Well, if this is one of your first visits to our church, you're going to feel today like you're coming in on the end of a conversation, which you are. We've spent the last seven weeks in a teaching series called Explore God, and we've looked at who God is and maybe some of our hesitations about Him from a variety of angles. And I'm glad that you're here. You can always go back online and watch the previous messages, but I want you to know why it's so important to me to do a series like this. There's really two big reasons. Number one, I want people who grew up with faith and church and then walked away for whatever reason to come back. Maybe that's your story, that you had a childhood faith. And the point, I guess, is that I want you to come back to the faith of your childhood without having to come back to a childhood version of your faith. To explore God in a way that acknowledges God is more robust than that. He's not as simplistic as maybe He was first presented to you. And there are answers to the questions that you've asked so that you now can develop as an adult an adult version of your faith. This is so important to me. I don't want you to have to take a simplistic view. I want you to bring your science and bring your skepticism and bring your questions and then build out a faith where the scriptures and the God of the universe can handle it in a way that we interact with Him. I also know that there's a whole group of people who have a view of faith or of church that is actually a caricatured view of faith or of church. Many times people will say something to me like this. They say, well, I'm not that interested in organized religion, to which I'm always kind of interested. I'm like, so what do you want? Disorganized religion? I understand what people are saying because I think there's, there's kind of three ways to view faith and spirituality, and one of them is purely institutional. That's what I think people call organized religion, and maybe you had an experience like that in your religious upbringing where everything was about the institution. It was about the pastor or the priest or something like that, and, and it almost was like the whole church served the institution. If that's your experience with faith and Christianity, I want you to walk away from that, but I don't want you to give up on Christianity itself. There are some people who would prefer just a purely individualized version of faith and spirituality, just you and God. And if you're in that camp, I understand the desire for that, but I also want to offer you a warning. Because most of the time when I talk to people who have that experience, here's what's happening. People have things they believe themselves, and then they just create God in their own image. And it's really interesting. God never disagrees with them. God always holds the same beliefs that they already held. And then they call this kind of a private or personal spirituality. And I think, oh, you should should really pay attention because actually what's going on in that version is that you're God. And I want you to know there's there's a slot between institutional and individual that I think is the authentic version of Christianity, and that is relational. The notion that God is personal, and He wants to know you, and He wants us to be a community together, and yeah, at times you'll have to submit to Him because He's God, but that's okay. Because even around a place like this, I always tell people, we're really just aiming for everyone here to do two things. I want you to gather on the weekends with us so that collectively we we do worship God, we do encounter communion, we do listen to His Word, we do express our generosity, we do that collectively. And then I want everyone here, and if you're not there yet, I want, you, I want this for you. I want to put you in a relationship with someone here who could be a spiritual leader in your life. That you're part of a group or part of a team. If you just do those two things, it's all relationally based. The weekend, engaged with God, and then on a team related to someone I could follow. And this is very important to me. Because at Suncrest, you can belong before you believe. At least at Suncrest, you can belong before you can believe. You can start serving, you can start participating as you're on a journey to faith. And why is this so important to me? Because I think it actually follows the model of Jesus. That if you see how people began to to move toward Him, they would follow Him before they had faith in Him. And I think inviting people into that experience to say belief doesn't have to come first. You can actually just start following. You can start belonging. You can start being part of something. And let that feed you toward a place where you believe. It's very important to me. And so we try to create the environment here on the weekends and all of our teams where, yes, you can come and explore God. Now, all seven weeks of this series, I've kind of opened it up 
uh, with a sentence. The sentence looked something like this. The next number of weeks will be a holistic approach to exploring God. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to start that way again, but there's no way I'm going to put the number one in that box. I mean, I don't want you all to not come back next week, right? And so let me tell you kind of my vision for this. The next 1,040 weeks will be a holistic experience of exploring God. What's 1,040? That's about, well, it's exactly 20 years, actually. And here's the point. I'm in my early 40s, and by that I mean 44. (laughs) And I think I have about 20 years left in me. And as long as I'm around, I can promise you that when we gather here, we will take a holistic approach to exploring God together. Lecture and lab, intellectual and practical. You can be here whether you're a follower of Jesus or whether you're a skeptic an agnostic, an atheist from a different religious background. We can do this together. In fact, next weekend, I really, really hope, do not miss next weekend. We're going to have an experience in our gathering here where I won't give too much of it away, but you will literally have the chance to be used by God to change someone's life. And it's going to be at a level that's very accessible to almost everybody in the room. We're going to share that experience together next weekend. Jen mentioned our Ash Wednesday experience coming up in about 10 days. Boy, I hope that you engage in that so that you have an experience in the weeks leading up to Easter that's personal with God where you can explore Him. The the weekend after that, we're going to start a brand new series. It's called The Beginner's Guide to Predicting Your Future. And you might be surprised on that weekend how much I can predict about your future because the scriptures tell a story of how we're laying out our lives. And week in and week out, we're going to do this, where we take this holistic view. But our question for today is a very important question. The question is, can I know God personally? Can I know God personally? Can I actually have a relationship with God? And as we walk into the answer to this question, I need to to ask you a personal question. I want to ask you to just be honest. To be honest with yourself. To be reflective enough as we walk into this conversation today to say, I'm the kind of person who would look into a mirror, and when I see myself in the mirror, I can acknowledge that there are things that aren't right. There are things I don't like. There are things I need to pay attention to. I don't know about you, but I think one of the most difficult things that a person can do is to be honest with themselves. Every time that I look in the mirror and I try to take an honest assessment of myself, I always walk away with a homework assignment. I look at myself and I say, man, there are some places that need some adjustment if I could just be honest. And this is so important relationally because a lot of you have relationships these days that are just broken. I don't know if they're broken with your kids or with your parents or with siblings or at work or in a marriage. But we know where this comes from. The the relationships would not be broken if both parties in the relationship could just be honest about themselves. Some of you are divorced today because either you or your ex-spouse or possibly both of you could not just be honest with themselves. And so as we explore a connection with God relationally, I want to ask you to just be honest. So this is the personal question that I I want to ask. It's kind of a precursor to that relationship. The question is, do you want to believe? The question, do you want to believe, is a different question than do you believe? And what I find is that that these two questions many times kind of get mixed and matched with one another. Someone will say they don't believe, or they're struggling to believe, or maybe they, they feel like they have one foot in belief and one foot out of belief. But if we're honest with ourselves, perhaps what's going on is that we don't actually want to believe. And so I want to ask you this question about yourself today. Do you want to believe? If you're a person who's struggling with faith or maybe who has given up on faith, here's one of the questions. Did you give up on faith because you stopped believing? Or did you give up on faith because you stopped wanting to believe? 
Now, most people would say, oh, Greg, why wouldn't you want to believe? Well, there's all kinds of reasons why people don't want to believe. Many times people kind of walk away from their, their faith, their childhood faith in, in the college years, and because they're in college, they chalk it up to an intellectual experience. But we know what else happens during the college years. It's a season of freedom. And people like freedom. And people like to make the decisions they want to make. And that childhood version of their faith sometimes gets in the way of our freedom. And so at the very same time when some questions are maybe rising up intellectually for us, there's also, if we're honest, the questions rising up of like, but I kind of want to do what I want to do. And if I believe in God or I acknowledge God, then, then that's off limits for me. And I really want to ask you today, do you want to believe? Blaise Pascal, about 400 years ago, one of the smartest people who ever lived on planet Earth, I think, we still use Pascal's law in physics, we still use Pascal's triangle in mathematics, we still use Pascal's wager in the philosophy of religion. I mean, he had the whole gamut covered, and this is what he said in his observation of humanity. He said, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. He says, let's be honest, 2% of the people in this room are actually on a truth quest. And if you are, I respect that. And about 98% of the people in this room aren't actually on a truth quest. We are on a happiness quest. And if we find something that doesn't bring us happiness or satisfaction or the feeling that we want, we actually are quite willing to adjust our whole worldview in order to keep pursuing something else. So I want to ask you today, about the way you see God? Is the issue God's existence? Or is it possible the issue is actually our resistance? Why would we resist? Well, because if God, there's accountability. If God, I'm accountable. And you've done things that are wrong, and I've done things that are wrong, and then we have to somehow reconcile, what are we going to do with those things that we did wrong? And most of the time when you and I do things wrong, we do the best we can to be dismissive of them, to justify them, to say, hey, nobody's perfect, or we just call it a mistake or something like that. But we know down deep inside that I'd like to make some choices that don't necessarily align with who God is, and if there is a God, then I'm accountable to that. That's a real reason that people resist a relationship with God. And I just want to ask you today to just be honest. If God this is a big problem, then I'm, we can't even hardly say it, can we? If God, then I'm wrong. And maybe you've been the person who's kind of announcing quietly or loudly to whoever around you that you're not sure that you believe, that you don't believe, that you believe something else or whatever, and to come back to faith means swallowing our pride. But my friends, why is it, why is it that pride, why is it that the that admitting we're wrong is so undesirable to us. To have to admit that I used to see the world this way and now I see the world this way. Don't we all know, when we're honest, that humility, that being able to say, yeah, I used to see it this way, but I was wrong, now I see it this way, is actually the pathway to life. It is the pathway to, to new experiences. It's the pathway to putting the past in the past and living a brand new life. It's a pathway so that I don't have to hold on to certain other views and I can be free to walk in a new way. Humility is so powerful. But it is this pride, it's this sense that I'm wrong that, that sometimes holds us up. And listen, we're all in good company. Because every one of us in this room is part of the stream of what I call the stream of rebellion of all humanity. And basically what happens in the way that I see it and the way I experience people's lives and stories is that in the midst of our rebellion, we either choose to double down on it and hold on or we choose to understand God could set us free from it and set a new course. Because if God, it's not just about accountability and about being wrong. If God, then there's forgiveness. And if you have anything in your story, 
anything that you've done, anything that's been done to you that, that you need to move forward from, it is the God of the universe who provides that way. The most powerful thing you can do on the path to forgiveness is to just be honest. Maybe it's time to say it. Say it. The truth is, I'm not going to justify this anymore. I'm not just going to call it a mistake. I'm not just going to say, well, nobody's perfect. I'm going to say it. Honestly, God... I knew it was going to hurt her, and I did it anyway. I actually made the choice because I wanted to feel something. I wanted to know something. I wanted to experience something. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was going to hurt her, and I did it anyway. God, what do I do with that? Just be honest. God, I know it was a lie. I knew I was cheating all the way along the way, and along the way I justified it, but I was cheating because I wanted a better result. God, that's who I am. That's what I did. Just be honest. God, I wanted to experience something. I wanted to feel something. And I didn't really care who was in my path. I didn't care what it did to them when I bullied them or to them when I hurt them or to them when I ran over them or to them when I fired them. It, I didn't care. I just wanted what I wanted. I'm just being honest. And if you can just be honest before God, this is the beauty of who God is. That he says, I forgive you. It's where cleansing takes place, supernatural cleansing. And you are actually set free to now live a life that honors him. Because if God, there's relationship. I promise you there's relationship. One of the conversations that I have when I'm talking with people about atheism and agnosticism is, is atheists will sometimes say, well, if there is a God, why wouldn't he just come and just wipe out all the ugliness of this world, just kind of, kind of push it away, just kind of push away the, the rebellion, the sinfulness, the ugliness, the disease, the suffering, why not just push it away and just make it go away? And my answer to that is always, because God loves us. And God's way to take care of the brokenness of this world was not to close his eyes and, and make it go away. It was to come and make a sacrifice for us. Because you and I know this is the mark, the hallmark of love and relationship. If you will give up things yourself for someone else, that's love. That's what God has done for us that he would send his son to take our sin and rebellion, even though it means enduring the cross. And then he asks us in return in that relationship to sacrifice some of the things we want in order to love him. That's relationship. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus of Nazareth had siblings on planet Earth, one of which was a guy named James. We come back to James a lot because we think it's so fascinating that this guy was actually a brother of Jesus. As near as we can tell, he was not a follower of his brother before death, burial, and resurrection. I'm not sure you would have been a follower of your brother either if he's walking around, you know, getting all the attention and saying he's God. But after the resurrection, it was undeniable. And so Jesus' own brother, James, followed him. Followed him actually to this degree that the way James' life ended is that he was killed, martyred for his faith. But before he was killed, he wrote a letter to, to us, to, to believers, to the church. Um, they weren't creative in naming the letters in the scripture, so they just called this one James. And this is what he wrote. He says, come near to God, and He will come near to you. Come near to God, and He will come near 
to you. God wants to know you and be known by you. He wants to love you and be loved by you. God is a father. He is relational to us. And he's always inviting us, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Part of the implication of this is that God is a gentleman. He does not force himself on you. But the moment that you would turn and come home, come home, come back to him, come near to him, he's ready and waiting for that relationship. And I don't know if you can picture the rest of your life in this relationship with the God of the universe. One where He gives you strength and endurance. One where you know that you're loved and accepted by Him, even if no one else. One where you hear His voice and you take His guidance and you respect His authority and you... Doesn't that sound beautiful? That's who God is. Come near to God. And He will come near to you. The next sentence is interesting. James says, wash your hands, you sinners. Now, I guess depending how you hear the tone of that when you read it, which is probably shaped by how your pastor or priest read it when you were a kid. I mean, I, you could read it like this. Wash your hands, you sinners. It's possible. You can, you, can, you can read it like that. I don't think it makes sense after he just said, come near to God. And God will come near to you. I think he says, man, there's a way for this forgiveness and this reconciliation and this relationship. You just come, just wash your hands. Just be honest. Acknowledge what you've done. Acknowledge what you want. Acknowledge the path you've been on. You come near to him and he will come near to you. Then he says this, purify your hearts. You double-minded so this is such a powerful phrase, and, th and this is for a very important crowd in this room. Bring purity to your heart. Stop, stop living in two worlds. Stop being double-minded. Because I'll be honest with you, many, many times in the conversations that I have, I have more respect for people who say, I don't believe, and then they live in alignment with that non-belief. I, I can respect that. I, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad for that conversation. I, I hope that you'll change your mind. I respect that. You know what's hard for me to respect? Is the double-minded. The crowd. Maybe you. Certainly, certainly sometimes me. That says, yes, God, I want your forgiveness. I want your love. I want the feelings that come with the good parts of God. But I'm absolutely keeping one foot over here in the world where I get to do what I want. Absolutely. I mean, I, I call myself a follower of Jesus. I may make this a regular practice of gathering on the weekends, but when it comes to the choices that I'm making about my money, about my relationships, about my anger, about my sex, about, what, about whatever it is, I reserve the right to do things my way. And James is saying, listen, that doesn't work in any relationship. That's the reason you got divorced, because people just couldn't be honest. Just purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. How do you come near to God and have Him come near to you? How can you know God personally? It always starts with just being honest. And so let me paint a picture for you with the time that I have left about how to walk in this day in and day out, to have a, a personal experience with God that isn't random, but instead is, is part of the routine of your life. And what I want you to see in this personal experience is that this relationship with God essentially follows the same principles of all your other relationships. If with God you would take the approach of noticing and listening and responding, noticing and listening and responding, noticing and listening and responding, then your daily experience with God can be a relationship. Listen, we know how important these principles are because 
If your marriage isn't so great right now, probably the reason is you're missing one or more of these. Maybe you just stop noticing. You just stop paying attention. Or maybe you notice and you listen, and then you ignore it. You don't actually respond to it. Relationships are funny that way. We have a son, our oldest son, Terrell, who's at boot camp right now in San Diego. And, you know, the job of parents when your son's at boot camp is to write them letters of encouragement. And Jenny, I've been writing like crazy. I mean, I'm writing him twice a week. I think Jenny's writing him five times a week. And, of course, there's, there's that little selfish part inside every parent is like, he's going to write us back, right? I mean, it's, it's not his job to write us back. It's his job to do boot camp. But we want him to write us back. And it took about a month before we got our first letter back from him. And it's kind of a realization, Terrell, he's not really a writer, right? A lot of teenage guys aren't into writing, so my wife, she's so awesome. She, she says, this is what we're going to do. She puts together a survey in a letter. She asks all her questions she wants with multiple choice answers. He just has to mark the box and send it back. <laughs> That's all he has to do. And last weekend, we got one of those back from him. It was so awesome. He's marking his answers, and he's writing a sentence or two in each one. And he actually wrote a, a little bit of a paragraph on the back, and he told my wife, he said, hey, just want you to know, I named my rifle after you. <laughs> How awesome is that? Jenny, the rifle. That's, that's good. And I, I just think, like, that's the beauty of this, right? You're, you're noticing and listening and responding. That's how relationships get built, and that's how your relationship with God gets built. I, I want to give you a simple practice today that you can carry forward with you every day. It's a practice that I use all the time. I share with people all the time. Uh, I mean, it's kind of making its way, I think, into the DNA of our church, but this is how you have a relationship with God. There's a verse that in the Gospel of Mark that, where Jesus says this. He says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, come near to God, and He will come near to you. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. There's a relational framework to this. Think about this with me. And even if you're not following along on the outline, this is probably the place to start so you can draw this out with me and you can use this day in and day out. You know, it says the time has come. And a lot of times when we think about the word time, we think of a timeline, you know, going forward. Um, the idea behind a timeline is actually that time has a beginning, it has an end. That's the word chronos, like chronological time. But that's not actually the word that Jesus uses in this statement. So we understand that as time's going from the start of my life to the end of my life, he says the time has come. And the word for time there is a word, the Greek word kairos, and it just means something significant is happening. It's a moment of truth. It's a defining moment. And you can even look at this as almost like X's along that timeline. Just like as you're going through your day, as you're going through your month, as you're going through your life, you will have moments where something will get your attention where you notice. And I really want you to think about this. Because in your day in and day out life, you should, in a relationship with God, be open to the idea that He's trying to get your attention. He's trying to speak to you. He does that in two ways. One is with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, if you follow Jesus, that lives inside of you. And when you're walking down the street or you're driving down the road or you're at work and you have a project that's due or you're trying to be at your kid's event, whatever, like all the time you should pay attention to, man, is God getting my attention? with something. So it happens with the Spirit. But, but sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I'm like, man, I'm not feeling it, God. And whenever that happens, I know the answer to that. It's to say it happens through the Spirit and these times come through the Scripture. I mean, if you tell me, oh, I want to hear from God, but you're not actually opening the Scriptures, I'd be like, you don't really want to hear from God, do you? Because that's where God speaks to us quite consistently. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw out the rest of this picture, but I first want to give you this, this little assignment. Two scriptures that I want to share with you. One is Matthew 5 through 7. One is the Gospel of John. And I've basically given you an option here that I hope you'll take this experience, if you want to know God personally, and move forward with this experience in the coming days or the coming months. Matthew 5 through 7 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I call it Jesus' Manifesto. It's kind of what he taught about everything. It's only three chapters long. And if you think, I, I just got to dip my toe in the water. I just need three chapters, Greg. I'd say, all right, no, no problem. Go to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and then here's what you do. This is very important. You don't say that's a three-day assignment because it's three chapters. You say, I'm going to start reading. And while I'm reading, I'm going to say, God, I'm going to stop whenever you get my attention with something. And I don't know what he's going to get your attention with. It'll probably be different for each one of us. 
It might be the place where in early chapter 5 he says, blessed are the peacemakers. And you think, man, I need to be a peacemaker. Or, Help me understand that. I'm going to stop and notice. So, so if you need to keep this really simple, you can just use Matthew 5 through 7. If you're ready for a little larger assignment, you can take the whole biography of Jesus. John chapter 1 through chapter 21, that's the whole story of Jesus in the gospel of John. And just read this through. And then as you read, just do this. Just read until something gets your attention. Every time when I read John chapter 1, it comes to this place where it says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And I always have to stop. That, that gets my attention every time. Like, man, how is that? Because I tend to live either in truth or in grace, but he was the fullness of both of it. What am I going to do with that? Well, that's the question, that when you pause and you notice these moments in your life, then you have to pause long enough to say, hey, I'm going to work it. And I use the image of a circle here to say at every one of those X's, I could pause and, and think about, okay, I need to maybe think about this, observe, reflect, discuss it with, with somebody I know, and, and then I'm going to have to put something into practice in my life. And then I can just move on because you can't sit there all day. You have to move on and keep living your life until the next Kairos moment. But you can experience God day in and day out like this. And you think, well, well, how's that circle actually supposed to work? It's in Mark 1.15. Remember he said, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. I think this is fascinating. Repent comes first. Repent is that place where I say, man, God, I was kind of seeing the world this way. My assumption was in this direction, but you got my attention, and now you're redirecting me. And sometimes that's very positive, because at one point I'm feeling like, man, I'm nothing, but I come across something in the Scripture, something from God. He says, no, you're not nothing. You're someone I love. It's a word of encouragement or affirmation. That's good news. And sometimes I notice he's teaching me something, and the honest truth is I'm not doing what he's teaching. I'm on a rebellious course, and I need to repent. And honestly, that's good news too, so that I don't stay on the wrong course. So you repent, you say, God, I know this is what you're saying to me. I'm hearing, I'm listening. But then you have to respond, and that's in belief. That means belief is just, God, I trust you to take how I just heard from you today and live into that, to live with the affirmation that I'm your child, not a nobody, or to live... (laughs) with the acknowledgement that I was on the wrong course and I'm going to reset the right course. Sometimes when I just kind of blow this whole thing out, I I put these questions here on the screen. What got my attention? What's God saying? What am I going to do about it? This is noticing, listening, and responding. My friends, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you can walk through every day of your life in a relationship with the God of the universe. Sometimes it will be His Spirit that prompts you. Sometimes you'll go through a circumstance and something will have your attention. You should, you should at least consider that that's God getting your attention. That the Spirit is prompting you to listen. And sometimes it's just because first thing you did in the morning was you opened up your scriptures and you read part of Jesus' manifesto or His biography or some other part of God's Word and said, I'm just going to read until something gets my attention. And day in and day out, You walk with God. You hear from God. You respond to God. Can you know God personally? You can. If you want to. You can come near to God. And He will come near to you. Let me pray for that right now. God, thanks for your goodness. Thank you that your posture toward us is one of love, that you're there to correct us when we need it, to give us direction when we need it, to comfort us when we need it, to forgive us as we always need it. And God, I pray that we would wash our hands of the sinfulness in our lives and that we would purify any place we're double-minded. God, thank you that when we come near to you, you come near to us. In Jesus' name.